Welcome to the Bear Marriage Podcast. I'm Sheila Ray Gregoire from BearMarriage.com, where we like to talk about healthy, evidence-based biblical advice for your sex life and your marriage. And this is episode, gosh, I think it's 196, something like that. And we are going to do a research episode. We're mm-hmm. going to talk about our own research. We're going to talk about some awesome new findings that Joanna has has yeah. found. I mean, this is the thing about our data set is it's so huge. And there's so much more that we can figure out. We just need to figure out the right questions to ask. Yeah, when you have this much data, when you have surveys that are as long as ours were, that looked at different aspects of this, of certain constructs, like mm-hmm. they're really, it, it's just, there's a reason that they are excited about it at the ARDA. Yes. <laughs> the archive, the American Religious Data Set Archive or whatever it's called, yeah. something like that. Uh, I can yes, our data remember. set is up at the ARDA where, where yeah. other reporters and researchers can use it. Yeah, but, but it has yeah. so much information. Yeah. And, you, and so we asked some new questions. We found some amazing new stuff about orgasm. So Joanna's yes. going to be joining us in a minute about that. We have two other um, studies that we've been alerted to because readers send them to us. Yeah, readers send us great stuff, especially in our Patreon group too. A lot of people in our Patreon just say mm-hmm. like, hey, have you seen this yet? That's and so great. we want to share some new findings with you because this is one of the goals of our of our podcast, of our blog, of everything we do is we just, we want things to be evidence-based because we believe what Jesus said. We actually take him at his word in Matthew 7, that a good tree can't bear bad fruit and a bad tree can't bear good fruit. Mm -hmm. And so you can recognize things by their fruit. And so it is good to judge the fruit. And that is what we're doing, looking at the fruit of different ideas and how that affects um, women's in particular, but even men's marital and sexual satisfaction. So before we dive into some of these new findings, Mm -hmm. let's just address some of the things that have been talked about regarding our research, because we have something really huge to celebrate. We do. Um, We've been working on this for a long time, (laughs) and specifically you and Joanna, Mm -hmm. um, mostly Joanna, and I will celebrate with her when she comes on the podcast as well. Um, But we finally have a paper that we have submitted to a collaborator, um, but it's, the manuscript's pretty much done, and we're going to be able to send it into a a journal really soon. Obviously, our collaborator is going to have some edits that we're going to have to do, but like, but like the bulk of the work is done. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. We've worked on it for a long time. And our research has already pretty much been uh, academics, researchers, people in the field, they like our stuff. Okay, we're, we're being used like our research is being used as Mm -hmm. a continuing education credit for physiotherapists. Yeah, because Joanna and I presented along with um, and they're still using Lori Mize at the American Physical Therapy Convention last year. And so like, we're talking about like our stuff has been deemed good enough for physical therapists, uh, you know, which is really exciting. Uh, the Journal of Physical Therapy um, did a positive review of our book. Um, yeah, which Great is, Sex Rescue. Which is amazing. And so really, we're just trying to, like, we've done all those steps. We've presented at academic conference. We've, you know, there are people in academia who are looking at what we're doing and saying, yeah, this is great. We also did have to submit a lot of information about how we got our data when we um, submitted the data set to the ARDA. And they said, yep, that looks good. So... Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're really just kind of this is a crossing the T's, dotting the I's yeah. kind of situation. And we just heard, and we just heard too that there's another um, man who's working on his PhD in sociology who's using our data set. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so for for some papers, so, so that's really exciting. Yeah, so it, it's, it really it's is. been really nice just seeing our stuff really accepted in the academic community and people who are, you know, frankly like way more educated than I am mm-hmm. are looking at this and saying, yeah, you guys did a good job. And yeah. that's just really nice. Yeah. Of course, one of the funny things that we've been running into as we talk about our research online is that a lot of people have a lot of questions and a lot of those questions are amazing and we answer them and they're great. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there are other questions where they don't really understand <laughs> that they're not really great questions. Yes. Okay, like I just... I'll just give you an example. Okay, like if people are, are critiquing our methods, say, I have concerns about your methods, and then we say, well, your concerns are unfounded because X, Y, and Z, and then they go off. And anyway, so I'll give you an example. It's like if you went to someone's house, mm-hmm. and or you were hosting someone at your house, okay? And you bring them out a perfectly cooked roast chicken. Okay. And they say, but was the oven on? And you're like, well, the, the chicken is cooked. <laughs> Why are you dodging the question? Was the oven on or not? Yeah. No, no, I'm not dodging the question. It's just that the, the chicken is cooked. <laughs> oh my gosh, but how can you possibly know that the oven was on? If you're not proving me any, pr- any proof, you're not giving me proof. Are you mm-hmm. avoiding the question? Mm-hmm. There is a thermometer inside the chicken. <laughs> the little doohickey inside the thermometer is pointing at cooked. Yeah. The chicken is cooked. Obviously, the oven was on. Oh, you're now you're admitting the oven is on? Well, where's your proof? There's... <laughs> the chicken is cooked. 
Yeah, and anyway, this is how we feel a lot, especially <laughs> especially around the question, the one that we get the most often, the accusation. Um, Shanti Felden used this one. Um, other people have as well. That we just found twenty thousand people who agreed with us. Yeah, or like, well, your res- your responses were just biased. People just lied to give you what they want. No, yeah. we actually because... can run things to prove that's not the case. Yeah, we can. But also, like... but also, our our findings are odds ratios for both great sex rescue and she deserves better. They're odds ratios, which means we we were judging the odds. Mm-hmm. Of ending up in a certain group based on beliefs. So that means we had to have people who believed things and people who didn't believe them so that we could compare them. If everybody believed like we did, we couldn't have written the books. And in fact, we had far more people who disagreed with us than who agreed which with us in, a, in, in, in both our data sets. Yeah, so, which is really quite funny. Yeah. yeah, it's like, is the chicken, like, was the oven on? Well, just look at the chicken. It's cooked. You cannot, anyway, yeah, yeah, that's exactly yeah. how it feels. So, so it is really funny. But yeah. but the nice thing is, I think by talking about this stuff and by yeah. explaining things like odds ratios, like I've had so many people say, oh my gosh, in my this came up in my work. Right, is like I was able to explain odds ratios, and we were able to take yeah. a better look at, at surveys because because of the stuff that they're learning on our podcast. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. So yes, research is great, and so now I am going to bring Joanna on so that she can tell us about some really cool new findings. Well, I am so pleased to invite my co-author, one of my co-authors for the Great Sex Rescue, and she deserves better, our wonderful stats person, Joanna Sawatsky, to the podcast. Hi, everybody. And we told everyone our great news that we have the manuscript just about finished. Well, the manuscript mm-hmm. is finished from our standpoint. We just sent it off to our collaborator. I have a couple we'll... tiny things to fix. Okay, yes. Like super we, tiny yes. additions. There's a citation or two. Yes, but we're we're really, we're almost there. And so this is awesome because mm-hmm. we've been working on this for a while. And yeah, there's more to come. So that's great. But as we were doing this, you know, when we when we looked at the Great Sex Rescue, we looked at orgasm rates and how each individual teaching affected orgasm rates. But what did you do this time? So I took orgasm and mm-hmm. getting aroused during sex and I put them together into an objective sexual satisfaction variable. So are you, is she enjoying sex and is she climaxing? Those are the right. two questions for that variable. And then I also uh, took that and I looked at it against all of the teachings together pooled. So the more you believed the teachings broadly, the more points you ended up getting. Right. So instead of just looking at each individual teaching, we looked at like everything. Let's, you know, mm -hmm. let's add all all of them together. together. That let me run more fancy, pretty stats. Uh So instead of just binary logistic regressions and odds ratios, now we're talking about uh, just regular regressions, multiple regressions. Uh, So I looked at the association between internalizing the teachings that we evaluated mm-hmm. in Great Sex Rescue and how that impacts orgasm rates. Mm-hmm. And it, it isn't good. <laughs> the more women internalize the teachings, the lower their objective sexual satisfaction goes. And right. it also uh, impacts their subjective sexual satisfaction. So whether that we're looking at whether or not she's feeling uh, satisfied with her orgasm or confident that she's going to get aroused. So that was one way we looked at subjective Sexual mm-hmm. satisfaction. The other way was looking at intimacy, a sense of that he's doing enough foreplay, a sense that her pleasure matters in sex, that she's interested in having sex, that she's not doing out of sense of obligation, all of those together. So pretty much all of the sexual satisfaction variables that we looked at, uh-huh. uh, no matter how we sliced it, the more you believe the teachings, the lower those scores get. Yeah. And so here's why, here's why I think this is really interesting. Cause we already told you that like obligation sex message is bad. Believing that a wife should have frequent sex to keep her husband from watching porn is bad. Believing that, you know, lust is every man's battle is bad. <laughs> like all of these things are bad. Believing that boys um, are going to push girls sexual boundaries. So she needs to be the gatekeeper is bad. And, you know, so, so we know all of these things are bad, but what's really interesting is that they're also bad cumulatively. Mm-hmm. So it's yeah. not just a question of of getting rid of each individual teaching, but it's really asking what are the environments where all of this stuff is taught all together? Mm-hmm. Yep. It, where is it the water that we swim in, right? Mm-hmm. And what I think is so interesting is seeing the evangelical authors' um, reaction to Great Sex Rescue. A lot of them have come out and they've been very vocally anti what they call duty sex because they don't want to say obligation sex. Right. But uh, in saying we don't do duty sex, we don't do duty sex, we don't do duty sex. That that is great, honestly. Like that's a that's a step. We will take it as the W. Yeah. <laughs> but if we're only taking away that piece, 
and saying, oh, well, of course, don't have duty sex, but also you need to be having frequent sex with him. And also, are you sending him nudes? <laughs> because he needs to have his brain be right so he only thinks that you're hot. Right. This isn't like, Gary Thomas written married sex. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, it's like mm-hmm. okay, at some point, we need to think about what is the whole ocean that we are swimming in? What is mm-hmm. toxic about all of it? Right. Mm-hmm. And what the, the, the common denominator between all of these teachings is that they a, take women's autonomy away. They say, you don't have control over your body. Your husband does. Okay. And then secondly, they tell her that she just, that, that she doesn't matter. They yeah. tell her that um, sex isn't for her mm-hmm. and that she isn't safe. Yeah, because they point, they paint men as these lust monsters, right? They paint men as as really incapable of emotional health and intimacy, and interested only in sex, only in sexual release, regardless of how their wife is feeling, which is just really a toxic way of seeing it. And and so, you know, just for coming out of um, the shiny happy people documentary that a lot of people watched, mm-hmm. uh, you know, in the last two weeks, and I think what it really shows is like, yeah, it isn't any one thing. It's the whole big picture. Mm -hmm. And this is why, and we've been talking about this with She Deserves Better too. Like, yes, church is good. Church is very, very good for all kinds of things. But as soon as you get all these toxic stuff, the benefits of church disappear. Mm -hmm. And so the type of church you're in matters. Yeah, yeah, it it really does. And this is what the new stats show too. So I think that's really interesting. Um, There was also something you were telling me um, when you when you look only at the women who don't reach orgasm. Yeah, so either they're they're not either not getting aroused or they're not climbing. So that score together if it's low. Okay. uh, Among that group, the more that they heard the teachings in church, the lower that score goes. So it was already low, but Mm -hmm. it goes lower and lower and lower the more they heard it in church. So we do not see that relationship between being exposed to these teachings in Christian media or in the family or um, in secular culture. So it's an interesting that in that particular group that's experiencing anorgasmia or is unable to become sexually aroused, it seems that the church uh, situation Mm -hmm. is really driving those scores even lower driving it down which is fascinating too right because it's Mm -hmm. like what is the environment that you are in and what is that environment teaching you about yeah your agency your autonomy um everything about sex like that's that is fascinating and again it's this wake-up call that there are a lot of churches right now that are toxic yep and you know, we need to realize that. And for every, anyone who didn't listen to my podcast with Beth Allison Barr a couple of weeks ago, when we talked about how to recognize a toxic church and what to do if you're in one and how to find a healthy one, please go back and and, and watch that or listen to that because that was super fascinating. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I had a friend a couple of years ago say, well, well, why is it that we're so much harder on Christians? Like wh- why? And I said, well, it's very simple because Christians are claiming to have divine backing for what they're saying Mm -hmm. and that's really powerful and people believe them then because they're saying god told me x y d that's a big claim to make and think of it as that i truly believe in the transformative power of the spirit of god you know i believe that aslan is on the move Mm -hmm. and so what's so tragic is seeing places where the beauty And the sense of grounding and hope that we can get from church, the sense of family with our brothers and sisters in Christ, the ability to build each other up, right? All of the beautiful history of our faith. If we're in toxic places, that stuff gets twisted. Mm -hmm. And that is so, so tragic. And so woe betide those of us who have been propping up those systems. And may we all find our way to a healthier place. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I hope that's the takeaway from shiny, happy people too. I hope, because honestly, like I, I couldn't see any daylight between what they were teaching and what so many of these other evangelical authors are teaching. It still says women don't have agency. It still says women, you're responsible if he lusts or you're responsible if he watches porn or you're responsible even if he abuses you. Like there's not a lot of daylight. And, you know, so it's, it's not just Bill Gothard. It's not just the IBLP. It's, it's everything with the way that we look at, at sex and, and women. And so I, I really hope that we can flood the healthy churches and build them up 
and that Mm -hmm. the toxic ones just kind of slowly melt away because this isn't of Jesus. And we at Bear Marriage take Jesus at his word in Matthew 7, when he said, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. (laughs) And so you will recognize them by their fruits. And like you said, (laughs) we just, we just did a whole new like regression analysis and the fruit is really rotten in these teachings. Mm -hmm. So let's get back to health. So I love it. Thank you. So you are working. So once this paper is in, what what is next? Okay. So I have, oh my goodness, I have so many paper ideas. <laughs> oh, so let's see. I want to do one doing a deep dive into male lust. Mm-hmm. That's high on my list. Because lust, it's like um, in Princess Bride, you keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. Yes, yes. Uh, to that one. I also really want to do one on actually on all these regressions I've been running. So just looking at the relationship between sexual satisfaction and whether it's objective or subjective and how that maps on to church attendance and the teachings and marital <laughs> satisfaction and just all sorts of stuff. Um, we're also working on one about deconstruction. Yeah. Yeah. That one's so. coming along. And I think that's it for right yeah. now. And but then we have wait. our big survey that's going to come out the next few, next month or two, um, our marriage survey yep. that we're going to be asking people to take for the marriage mm-hmm. book that Keith and I are writing. So look for that. Joanne and I are busy. We're going to start writing that next week. And then mm-hmm. um, in two weeks, just to let all our listeners know, we are going to do a webinar um, on new wine skins, just where I'm going to present our big picture findings so that if you want to talk to your church leadership about this stuff, because you're feeling like your church leadership isn't teaching on this well. Or if you're in church leadership and you want to educate the rest of your staff and volunteers, that's what this webinar is going to be for, is like, how can we spread the word about these findings so that people stop saying the toxic stuff and so that we become a healthy place. So take a look um, for that webinar. Make sure you're signed up to our email list because we will be advertising that next week. Or actually probably this week it's already on the blog. So I will put a link. I will put a link to where you can sign up for the webinar, where you can sign up for the email list, but that's going to be running coming next week. It's going to be super exciting. Well thank you Joanna. Always great to have you here. <laughs> so glad to be here. All right. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye. Rebecca's back with me now. Joanna has gone. And we want to take a look at two different journal articles um, that people have sent us. This first one, I think has been sent to us to me by at least two dozen people. It's really awesome. It was out last year, um, 24th of May, in the Journal of Sex Research. And it is based, I love this, okay, it is based on um, a survey of midlife Canadian women. 324 women and 275 men. men. I yes. just, I, I'm sorry, we need to take a second because yes. whenever we see stuff like this, we always count how many surveys we would need to get our data set. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this is approximately like this 600. This is approximately 600 people. So yeah, so we had 20,000 in our women's one alone. So just, yes. just guys, just thinking. Yeah, and so this was a journal article with 600 people and it was an on, it, it again was an online um, survey. So it was yeah. a question. So very much like what we did. Yeah, and, um, and I'm, I'm sorry, I just actually want to make, I'm not, I'm not like dissing these researchers. I'm more just proud of us it's perfectly yeah. acceptable to have a survey with only a couple hundred people that's actually most, pretty standard most, yeah that is standard yeah it is so standard. i just want to make sure it didn't sound like i was saying oh they only got that many no i wasn't saying oh they only got that many i was saying wow we got so many yeah that's that's the I, that's the difference I just yeah because sure a say. thousand is considered big oh, for yeah. most for most studies so yeah and we had twenty thousand. all right so here's here's what this one found and the title of this article is motives between the sheets understanding obligation for sex at midlife and associated associations with sexual and relationship satisfaction. All right. Do you want to read the abstract? Sure. So that's the, the abstract. Just, just again, we're just going to educate people here. So the abstract at the beginning of any academic paper, there's an abstract that how many words is it usually like uh, 250? 175 to 400, depending on the journal, I think. Okay. Yeah. And but it like, kind of not, summarizes. It's usually about 250. It's usually about 250. Yeah. It summarizes everything. So here's the summary of this yeah, article. And I'm going to read a part of it. This study investigated reasons for sex at last sex. So they are asking about well, the last time that you had sex, did you? Kind of mm-hmm. thing. With a focus on obligation, an avoidance motivation, and doing something nice for a partner, an approach motivation, and their associations with sexual and relationship satisfaction while controlling for marital duration, age, and sexual desire. 
Obligation was reported as a reason for having sex by 12.4% of women and only 1.8% of men. I added the only. <laughs> and 1.8% of men. Doing something nice was reported by 10.2% of women and 9.5% of men. And in regression analyses, women who reported having sex for obligation had significantly lower relationship satisfaction and sexual satisfaction than women who did not report this reason. In contrast, having sex to do something nice for one's partner was associated with higher sexual satisfaction among women. Findings indicate that having sex when feeling obligated may be associated with negative sexual and relational outcomes among midlife women. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes total sense. So this is exactly in line line with what we found. It's like, as soon as you believe the obligation sex message, orgasm rates go down, marital satisfaction goes down, and the biggest thing that we found was that rates of sexual pain increased to almost the same statistical effect as prior abuse. Because our bodies literally interpret the obligation sex message as trauma. Yeah, you can't say no. You can't say no. Now, I, I, I wanna I wanna delve into something here that I found really interesting. Okay. Okay. I want to give the same one that I think of. So they're saying that the obligation sex message mm-hmm. makes makes sex worse for women, but the doing something nice actually makes sex better. And yeah. what I've noticed in the last few years since we've really mm-hmm. began talking about obligation sex is that authors are moving away from the obligation sex message and towards the, don't you just want to do something nice? And it is a for unless you have specifically gotten rid of the obligation sex message, it is just another form well, of obligation sex. Well, because the question sex. is, why are you doing something nice? Mm-hmm. Right? Is it because you have a great sex life and you're like, yeah, I'm going to mm-hmm. treat them. Like, I don't mm-hmm. know. Like, yeah. Yeah, like, I don't particularly (laughs) feel like it right now, but it's not a negative. Yeah, exactly. It's like, are you doing something nice? Because there's just this pattern of your relationship of giving and receiving, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm sorry, I'm immediately going to go into the Friends monologue by Joey, if anyone knows what I'm talking about. Giving (laughs) and receive as we have and share. (laughs) To give what we have and share what we receive. (laughs) Anyway, well, if that's that's the mentality that your relationship is, is having overall, then... Yeah, it might not be that doing things that are nice for your spouse makes you happier with sex as much as people who are really happy with sex are Mm -hmm. more likely to want to do just nice things for their spouse, Mm -hmm. right? Like it might, the question is, where does the causality happen? What's the chicken? What's the egg? Yeah, but what I find, but but what I want to make sure the takeaway from this is, is that we don't is that we don't just change the approach. We don't just say, because I'm, I, I, mm. I am seeing people yes, do that's this. True. That's I true. am seeing people do this. They're saying, okay, we're not going to say obligation, but we are going to say, this is such a precious gift and it's such yes. a great thing to do for your spouse. So why wouldn't you do it more? And I used to talk like this all the time. Yeah, and to this be completely is... fair, I do see a lot of very healthy people who we know are beneficial for women's sexuality saying this too. Emily Nagoski, that is her bylaw. Right, but the difference is, there is a difference, yes. which is obligation has been specifically taken out of the marriage and so emily nagoski yes she talks about doing stuff doing mm-hmm. something nice for your spouse yeah and, but and she does prioritizing it, sex even when you don't feel like it in the moment right. and that kind of thing but she does it after explicitly talking against obligation yeah exactly and that's the difference and so in the christian community the problem is we can't just replace one with the other we have to specifically demolish the one first before we can talk about the other yeah and also genuinely making it not as much of a of a of a spiritual necessity too Mm -hmm. like you're a good wife if you do this and god is disappointed in you if you don't Mm -hmm. right i think that's also the added level of confusion that can happen there yeah okay so i want to read to you a passage from the book sheet music yes by kevin lehman where he says this this means there may be times when you have sex out of mercy obligation or commitment and without any real desire Yes, it may feel forced. It might feel planned and you may fight to stop yourself from just shoving your partner away and saying enough already. But the root issue is this. You're acting out of love. You're honoring your commitment. And that's a wonderful thing to do. Yeah. No, it's not. And what this study has shown, what our study for the Great Sex Rescue showed is that it is not it's a not. wonderful thing to do. It's not a wonderful thing to do. It's a thing that will just, it's chipping away at the foundation of goodwill in your marriage. Mm-hmm. Every time it happens, it chips away at that foundation until it all just topples over. And as we said repeatedly in the Great Sex Rescue, and I will say it again, what we found is that when these five things are present... Frequency takes care of itself. You don't need the obligation message. What you need is these five things. High relationship satisfaction, Mm -hmm. feeling emotionally close during sex, Mm -hmm. 
Um, a wife who frequently orgasms. Yeah, well, mm-hmm. which means both partners are frequently orgasms. Exactly. Because we didn't really have men who didn't. Right. No orgasms. sexual dysfunction and no porn use. Yeah. And so let's stop talking about obligation and start talking about those five things. Exactly. And then things will be fine. It, and I think this is the underlying problem is that people are honestly sure that if we don't talk about obligation, women will just stop having sex. And it's like, yeah, they might. And then frankly... A lot of research kind of seems to be that is the bed that you made. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. I'm just going to say, like, I think it's, if, if the only thing that's making a woman want to have sex in their marriage is mm-hmm. that she feels like if she doesn't, God will smite her yeah. and that she's a failure, then maybe she's not the problem. Like, mm-hmm. maybe there are other things that have happened. Mm-hmm. And maybe she shouldn't be having sex then. Like, there's just... Anyway, we go up into all this in GSR about how to get back to healthy sex, but... Yes, yeah, so please check out Great Sex Rescue. Okay, we have another study. Yes. Um, and this one's this one's um, uh, really interesting. Okay, to, to, to hone in on this obligation message, mm-hmm. um, and this is this is going to take a little bit of a sad turn, okay? Yeah. So, because I am, I am going to talk about some marital rape and an abuse situation. But a woman wrote to me, um, and... She has been going through years of trying to get counseling. Their relationship is really abusive. Um, sex has become a big problem because it has been obligation and it, at times has even gone into coercion. And so she's been reaching out to her pastor. She's been reaching out to her pastor's wife. She's um, considering separation. And I think at this point she has. But she shared with me some emails between her and her pastor's wife. And the reason that I want to read these is I want to show you how common the obligation message is that is being given to women in evangelical circles. It's kind of like, okay, so the shiny happy people documentary that came out two weeks ago and that took the world by storm. We can take the wrong lesson from that. You know, we can, we can take the lesson that, oh, wow, Gothard was incredibly abusive and terrible. And good thing everyone knows it now and this isn't a problem anymore. Yeah. (laughs) That's not the lesson we should take. The lesson that we should take is that, these teachings infiltrated evangelicalism. Mm-hmm. And when I was watching that documentary, I heard things straight from Dan Gresh's Secret Keeper Girl. Oh, gosh, yeah. Like, Gothard talked about the ceramic um, mug versus the china teacup. Mm-hmm. Gothard talked about dressing with eye traps. Yeah. You know? And these are all things that are in Dan Gresh's books. This so concept, Yeah, the concepts are just... It's... It's all the same. It's all the same. And so um, I'm reading you this this email that was sent just from a normal church in, in Canada. Yeah. And by normal, I mean, like, we're not talking about, like, the most fundamentalist of no. fundamentalist churches. Like, this is the kind of thing that is, you'd walk in and think, oh, these are just everyday people. Yeah. And so this is what the pastor's wife wrote to this woman who has already explained the abuse mm-hmm. and marital rape in her marriage. She says this. 1 Corinthians 7, 2-3 makes it plain that physical sexual intimacy is the means whereby the husband and wife are mutually protected from violations of God's law with respect to sexual desire because it provides the proper context for the expression of these desires and the satisfaction and fulfillment that God intends that we derive from them. Verses 4 to 5 indicate that the wife and husband are both to make themselves available to the other partner physically. To refuse to do so is defrauding the other and making them more vulnerable to the attacks of Satan, particularly in the area of sexuality. These are clear commands of scripture and like all commands are to be willingly obeyed. However, there isn't no abdication of choice here. The picture is that of the giving of a gift, (laughs) a gift that you have agreed and covenanted together to make available to one another. There is no right granted to the other partner to take what has been promised against the will of the other person. The Bible does not condone this type of sexual abuse within a marriage as though a husband may take from the wife or the wife from her husband. This is to be a loving act of self-sacrifice for the sake of the other. This too is a two-way street, and I, for one, do not think that it is reasonable to suggest that a woman who is still recovering physically from the birth of her child has to offer her body to her husband, at least not for vaginal penetration. Oh my gosh. The sexual relationship is designed to both reflect and build intimacy. It is difficult to be physically intimate when there is a distance or unresolved issues in the marriage, but to refuse to do so categorically is to neglect one way that the Bible serves to build it. The issues that your husband has, however complex and sinful, are never going to be rebuilt neurologically until new proper sexual habits are established with you. They love to use that word neurologically. They have no idea what it means. No, exactly. It's, such a, it's just such a, that's a nonsense sentence. Anyway, I'm sorry. Yes. You are asking him to change, but denying him the means by which the scripture indicates that such sin is avoided. 
you will have to decide if you are willing to make that sacrifice. Make it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yep, yar, make it. <laughs> you keep talking about until he is safe or things change. What does this actually look like and mean? It means until he's safe or things change. That's what it means. Oh my goodness. How will you know when it happens? What when step- it will happen when he's safe and he changes. <laughs> what steps are you willing to take as his wife to support him in this process? Finding safety and waiting for him to change. Do you, oh my gosh. Do you, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I will let you read this. I'm done. <laughs> do you believe that what you are doing now in the relationship is helping or hurting the very thing you want to see? You may not like to hear this, but the vast majority of what you have written is entirely focused on yourself. It is entirely understandable and perhaps even justifiable from a human perspective, but are you confident that this is how God has called you to respond to the hurt and abuse that has occurred in your life? Yes. No no arsenal of self-soothing strategies is any match for the peace that Christ offered that is only available by obedience to him. I am praying for you. I love you. No, she doesn't. That is total spiritual abuse. That is, this is the most... This is the most asinine response I've ever seen. This is a, an evil response. This is yeah. terrible. It's not only evil. It's also laughable how illogical it is mm-hmm. and how it's just so wrong. Yeah. But this is exactly what that study's saying. She's yeah. saying it's not obligation. It's a gift. You get to have sex with a rapist. Yeah. Oh my goodness. How <laughs> lucky are you? <laughs> Have all that sex with your rapist. You're so lucky. Yeah, because essentially what Sorry, she's saying... Sorry, I went immediately to my Michelle Duggar voice. There. Yes. What she's saying is it wouldn't be rape <sighs> if you were happy about it. Exactly. And so the problem is not that it's rape. The, the problem, problem is that, is that you're not, not happy about it. The problem is that she's not consenting. You just yeah. have to consent to the sex you don't want to consent to. That's mm-hmm. the whole problem. Mm-hmm. Your problem is that you're not consenting. If you were consenting to the sex that you don't want to have, if you were consenting to the non-sens- non-consensual sex, mm-hmm. then there wouldn't be any non-consensual sex so clearly you're the problem yes exactly because we can't stop him from raping you but we can tell you to shut up no and we can't stop him from raping you because sex intercourse having one-sided intercourse with your spouse where you ejaculate and she does nothing and she hates it and feels terrible is the means by which god has ordained that he um overcomes temptation and in this case porn and yeah, things which is like that. just not at all and it's you can just... listen to our podcast from a couple of weeks ago on male centric <sighs> sex to talk about the problems with that view but this is essentially what she's saying yeah. is that his right to have intercourse with his wife yeah. is the means by which god gave him so that he doesn't sin and it's such a low view of men it's an entirely inaccurate view of how we get over um compulsive sexual behaviors it's an inaccurate view of emotional wellness and healing like him having sex with his wife when she is being abused is only going to solidify his selfishness Mm -hmm. and her abuse. Yeah, him being allowed to continue to rape someone isn't going to suddenly make him not want to rape people anymore. He's going to learn he can get away with it. Exactly. And so, again, this is just really problematic. And if you are in a church where a pastor's wife would ever send this Mm -hmm. kind of an email to you or to a friend, get out. Like churches like this are are doing so much harm, mm-hmm. and this is not the way that we should be treating abused women. No, it's not. That's not the way we should be treating anyone. No, it really isn't, that's and it's a total sweet. misunderstanding of what sex is too. A yeah. complete misunderstanding. And by the way, just I love. I, I don't love, but I just that that whole thing about how. You know, I don't think it's reasonable to expect a woman recovering from the birth of her child to offer her body to her husband, at least not for vaginal penetration. So she agrees it's not reasonable to tell a woman that she has to have intercourse, but it is reasonable to tell her other things. It's just disgusting. It's it's very much a problem. And for her to end the letter saying that she loves her, this is the opposite of love. Love is this is hatred. This This is is actually hatred. This is hatred. To wish bad to to actively like enable it's just bad. It's just bad. Yeah, it really is. Okay. So let's go to the other one. So that shows why the importance of asking why in research, because we have to ask why is it that giving a gift or doing Mm -hmm. something nice for your spouse is related with better sexual satisfaction? We have Mm -hmm. to ask why, because it's definitely not the one that creates the sexual satisfaction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's because it's a natural consequence of a healthy relationship. And so what that pastor's wife, that crap she was spewing is absolute bananas terrible yeah, exactly because you can't you can't give a gift if you still also believe in the obligation sex message they just they, they they don't go together at all 
Okay, so here is another one that I've been sent by several people on Instagram. Super, super interesting. Um, some research that came, I believe it's out of the University of Arizona. I could have that wrong. Um, but this article is called The Other Third Shift, Women's Emotion Work mm-hmm. in Their Sexual Relationships. Yeah. And I have a bunch of excerpts I actually want to read. They're kind mm-hmm. of long, but they're they're really good. Or do what why sure. don't you start with the the um with abstract? The sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, The concept of emotional labor have been used far less often to address inequalities within private interpersonal relationships, particularly heterosexual romantic relationships. We identified four areas of emotion work present in women's sexual lives, including one, faking orgasms, two, tolerating sexual pain, three, defining sexual satisfaction based on the partner's pleasure, and four, narrating sex they call bad sex as acceptable because of a partner's satisfaction. Nearly all women mentioned emotion work as part of their current or past sexual experiences, as women described frequently enduring unsatisfying sex to provide their male partners with feelings of power, sexual skillfulness and dominance particularly during heterosex so that's just sex between heterosexual couples Mm -hmm. we discuss the implications for gendered elements of sexual satisfaction feelings about sex that women do not expect to feel pleasurable expectations about deservingness and entitlement to sexual pleasure sexual agency and diverse interpretations of the significance of orgasm so yeah really interesting study yeah and so basically the 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 thesis is that women are doing the majority of the emotional labor Mm -hmm. during sex. And um, we've talked a lot about mental load and emotional labor in other contexts. So in in, on this podcast, so mental load is when women take on the responsibility for all of the tiny decisions and details that go into the family running the house. You know, when do we need to take the car in for an oil change? When are they coming to fix the air conditioner? When's the homework due? What what homework do we have? Um, Are is Johnny's soccer outfit out of the laundry, where are the cleats, like all these things that are, you know, who do we have to carpool with this week, all these things are in her head and not his. Um, And so that's exhausting. Emotional labor is kind of managing the relationships and the emotions of everyone in the family. So when the siblings start, you know, fighting, it's the mom is often the one who figures that out it's the woman who figures out what birthday present are we going to buy for your mom and are we going to have her over for dinner it's even like thinking to remind the husband that maybe he should plan something for a really significant moment in his dad's life something like that yeah so it's the emotional labor and and what they're doing is they're taking this idea of emotional labor and then putting it onto sex and saying what are some of the labors that women are doing and it's primarily women they're doing this is what they found in order to manage the emotions yes of the other person. Mm -hmm. And they found these four things. So here, here's an excerpt from later on in the article. Women manage their own and their partner's feelings during sex. Women's ability to both express their sexual needs and manage their partner's feelings frequently led to sexual ambivalence. Mm. Women often felt distrust, anger, and fear about talking to their partners about their sexual needs, all while trying to ensure that their partners enjoyed sex and felt comfortable and loved. So women themselves are not enjoying things. They're not feeling comfortable in love. Right. But they're, but, making, sure but they're making sure their partner is. Um, Elliot and Umbersome describe this as emotion work within marriages around the performance of sexual desire. While Brianne Foss, who's actually one of the authors on this, um, articulated that women perform emotion work around a variety of sexual events. And she lists a yeah. bunch, including like labeling coercion as rape, not labeling coercion as rape. Yeah, and acting like you're satisfied even if you're not. So faking orgasm. Yeah. The kinds of emotion work women performed during heterosex ranged from engaging in unwanted sex in exchange for their male partners doing the housework (laughs) to women expressing sexual desire to their partners even when they would rather not have sex. Ooh, yeah. Yeah, particularly given the strong imperative for orgasmic reciprocity during sex, many women across a range of backgrounds felt obligated to both have an orgasm and to provide their partners with pleasure. Further, women who value gender conformity often base their sexual satisfaction on their partner's approval, leading to lower sexual autonomy. Yeah, this is like totally in line with what we saw in the books. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, and and I want to read, I want to actually get um, a quote from Shanti Feldon's book for women only, which actually yes. describes and tells women that they need to perform oh, emotional yeah. labor during sex. Yeah, there's like so much of it in there. In her book for women only, what she's saying is that what men really need isn't just sex, but to feel like you emotionally want to be there. Yeah, they don't just want duty sex. They want you to enjoy the sex. Right. And so I just want to read you a paragraph. 
First, know that you're responding to a tender heart hiding behind all that testosterone. If at all possible, respond to his advances with your full emotional involvement, knowing that you're touching his heart. But if responding physically seems out of the question, let your words be heart words, reassuring, affirming, adoring. Do everything in your power using words and actions your husband understands to keep those pangs of personal rejection from striking the man you love. Leave him in no doubt that you love to love him. Yeah. And remember, if you do respond physically, but do it just to meet his needs without getting engaged, you're not actually meeting his needs. In fact, you might as well send him out to clip the hedges. So enjoy God's intimate gift and make the most of it. I hate that last sentence. Mm -hmm. You might as well, just using your body to get off isn't what he wants. You might as well do a chore. You're talking to women who have allowed men to use their bodies. They thought God wanted it and it, it like experienced rape. And now you're saying, oh, well, it just felt like a chore. Like... Even mm-hmm. just that bothers me so much because the idea mm-hmm. that like, anyway, that's a whole other podcast. But but that's... but but what you see here is that she is telling women to take on emotional labor Absolutely. during sex because our goal, like our our big aim is to make him feel affirmed and adored. It is not to experience intimacy during sex. It is not to have a mutual experience. And there's so much emphasis on the emotional repercussions to him. If she doesn't want to have sex, is she even allowed to not want to have sex? And there's so much pressure for her to perform. Like, look at the kinds of things these women were were doing, right? Mm -hmm. The idea of uh, they were performing as satisfied even when they weren't even when they weren't they were expressing sexual desires to their partners even when they would rather not have sex yeah and these are things that she that 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 is is explicitly talked about in for women only oh yeah like i don't i think this is an a leads to b situation like this Mm -hmm. is just they're the same picture like it's yeah yeah Uh, that meme from the office it's the same picture it's the same picture it's the same picture as pam says yeah Yeah. like and this and this is the problem there's there's nothing in for women only that talks about how like if you're not receiving pleasure that's a problem or like you shouldn't have to force yourself to want sex and like you deserve to have a sex life that you want to have because mm-hmm. the focus in on sex here is on making sure he feels emotionally validated mm-hmm. that he fe- he gets what he needs but there's no talk about her getting what she needs mm-hmm. and it even says like if you can't feel pleasure go see a counselor mm-hmm. which okay that's that's good that she at least says that but what we found over and over again in Great Sex Rescue is that the biggest predictor of women's orgasm, like the biggest problem is, is lack, of, a lack of therapy. It's, yeah, a, it's lack a lack of foreplay. foreplay. It, it's the fact that he is not tending to her needs. And as we found in our survey of men, 72% of men um, think they do enough foreplay even when their wife doesn't orgasm. Mm-hmm. And I know a lot of people say, yeah, but Shanti was only writing for women only. She wasn't writing to the men. Mm-hmm. Um, but... That means she was writing to women who are married to men who are selfish and who are raping right. them. And, and it's like you do you owe something to those women. But too. also, even if you're writing to women, what is the goal of sex? The goal yeah. of sex should be intimacy and mutual pleasure. Well, I just don't understand why she couldn't have said like, hey, if you're in a marriage where you really like sex, sex is great, but you're just really tired, make it a little bit more of a priority. But if sex is always like, but if you're in a marriage where sex is not pleasurable for you, like you need to deal with that first and your husband being gripey about not getting enough, that's kind of something you guys need to deal with separately because that's if you should be wanting the sex that's not what she says what she says is if you don't have sex he's going to be devastated emotionally you will have crushed the small scared just needing reassurance little kid inside of his heart Mm -hmm. like she and she also doesn't deal with the fact that a lot of men put such an emphasis on sex because they have channeled their emotional needs into sex and that's actually not healthy and so yes a lot of men are saying i need sex and i need her to be enthusiastic for me to feel like i'm worthwhile that's not necessarily a good thing. I mean, wanting a great sex life is a great thing. Wanting to be intimate, wanting your wife to feel involved, that is a good thing. But needing that in order to feel emotionally validated is a bit of a problem. Well, and I think I think that it's a problem when you're trying to separate the, the consequences from the action, right? I don't mm-hmm. think there's anything wrong with like a healthy couple being like, I 
would like the idea of a relationship does often need sex yes right the individuals don't but mm-hmm. relationships if there's not a good sex life there's a reason it's like okay there's probably a reason your relationship is probably going to go downhill right but i think that there's there's a difference between saying that and saying i need to feel affirmed through sex and i don't need to do the things that would lead to that happening naturally mm-hmm. that's the problem is that men say well, all my yeah. needs are here but i'm not going to put any energy into this yeah right so i expect to have channeled all of my needs here and have them all met, but I'm not going to channel a similar amount of my energy and focus and pursuit mm-hmm. here. I'm just going to sit here and say, you need to do this to me and make me feel like I did a good job, even though I'm not doing anything to actually make it good for you. Yeah. Yeah. It's re- and, then, and then the advice to women is... And you need to take care of this. Because his feelings will get hurt. Yeah, yeah. because his fault that his feelings get super hurt because he has needs there. And, and there's yeah. nothing in there about women's feelings. And that's really the problem. And that's that's the point of this article is that the emotional labor of sex is largely dealt with by women. It is not dealt with by men. Um, and uh, and that, yeah, that yeah. that is a big issue well, that I needs to like, deal with. I mean, on a weirder note, I know that one of the things that, because of this job, <laughs> oh, whenever you start something with because of this job you know it's always gonna go a weird way I mean, because of this job you know obviously i'm one of the people who a lot of people go to for sex questions and mm-hmm. like problems and if people don't like something they come to us and they say things and why don't we want sex why doesn't she want sex well all this stuff anyway this is my lot in life um but one of the recurring things that i've heard from people is that women will often say, I don't like having sex because I'm just so tired and then I don't want to have to like change the sheets and have a shower and get all cleaned up and like there's had to deal with like the semen afterwards and stuff Mm -hmm. like that. And he just kind of rolls over and goes to bed and then she's dealing with all this stuff because he's like, well, I'm okay going to bed. And she's like, well, I'm not going to bed in crusty sheets, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and then I I talk to them and I'm like, well, then why doesn't he just wear a condom? If he doesn't want to do cleanup. Mm Mm-hmm. You can just wear a condom and then it's like a very quick personal cleanup and you can just go to bed. It's a lot easier. And and without a without a doubt, like every single time pretty much the man says, yeah, but then I, it just doesn't feel as good. I was like, okay, your wife doesn't want to have sex mm-hmm. because you are not wearing a condom. <laughs> it's the, she's like, no, like sex feels good when we have it. I'm just so tired. I don't want to do extra labor. Mm-hmm. And it's like, if both of you, there's going to be something that dampens your experience. <laughs> dampens <laughs> dampens ah, ha, ha, that's funny no but you have something <laughs> that dampens your experience okay for the man i ask do you still want to have sex if you wear a condom well yeah okay then clearly that's not as bad mm-hmm. like yeah. if we're we're talking about something here where it's like this is bad enough for her and it's probably because there's a larger pattern that he doesn't pick up his fair share of things and she carries a lot of the emotional labor mm-hmm. and mental load but here's an area where You taking on a slight inconvenience for yourself, which, by the way, the majority of men around the world take on as well, Mm -hmm. like, without it being a big deal. Yeah. Okay? You have that, or you can just say, I don't want to, but I still want you to do everything that I want you to do, and make your wife actively not want to have sex, and so therefore, like, have even more Mm -hmm. of a damage to her experience. And it's just selfish. And this is what the emotional labor really comes down to. Mm-hmm. It's like, why on earth? And I'm not saying I want to use condoms or you can't. That's not, I'm just, you know, that's just an example of like, mm-hmm. if this is the kind of thing, there are things that make sex not pleasurable for women. And they're different from woman to woman. But we as women have been trained to be the ones to deal with it. And so when there's even a thought that the man could be the one to deal with it, it's just kind of silly. Yeah, the one that I find um, so common is the pill. Because yes. for a lot of women, first of all, it's it's a pain to have to get. You have to go to the doctor. You have to get prescriptions. You have to mm-hmm. remember to take it at the same time every day. Um, but for a lot of women, it reduces their libido yeah. because it gets rid of the hormonal spike around ovulation. It can increase mental health problems. It can increase mental health problems. It, it can cause other risk. issues. You know, for some women, they love it and it works great mm-hmm. and it's fine. But for some women, it really doesn't. But the men refuse to use a condom. And so they're putting all of this on women. Yeah. And it's, and it's like, there's times, if it's the actual choice of the couple, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. But I just hate it when I hear it being like, yeah, I'd rather not use the pill, but he won't use a condom. It's like, no, yeah. that's not acceptable. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. that's not, it's not acceptable. <laughs> yeah. Those are just, the, like, condoms are so much easier. And, and it's like, he would rather not have a slightly diminished pleasure. But then she has to go through a massively diminished pleasure because her libido, and also for just, so many women, their libido. Well, and also just like throughout the month. 
Mm-hmm. Like her entire life now shifts for a lot of women. And I'm someone for whom the pill is really quite bad for. Yeah. I actually got quite suicidal while I was on it. Yeah. Um, and the minute I got off it, I was like, oh, look, the grass is green. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. You know, like this stuff is real. And there are so many women who suffer from side effects and who don't even consider just telling their husbands, okay, then no sex unless there's a condom involved. Mm-hmm. Because they know that he won't do it. Yeah. And, and it's so, just, it's and so just she so has taken on all of that labor and there's this idea that he shouldn't have to bear any of it. So it is a, it is a really big problem. So anyway, those are the new studies that we wanted mm-hmm. to share with you and our new findings um, around orgasm. So yeah, just some really interesting stuff that reinforces you know our fundamental things in great sex rescue, which is that yeah. sex should be mutual, intimate, and pleasurable for both. And when we focus solely on the guy, and when we focus on a kind of relationship which elevates the man over the woman and which works directly against intimacy, sex is not going to be as great. Yeah. It really isn't. And so we need to prioritize both. And we need to really aim for intimacy. That's definitely it. Okay, I've actually brought Joanna Sawatsky back on the podcast to end this episode out for us. Hello, Joanna. Hi, everybody. So we recorded all that other stuff earlier. And then something happened in the last few days. And I just thought we could comment on it at the end of this Mm evidence-based research-oriented podcast, which is that a lot of the commentary around the docu-series for Shiny Happy People has been um, some of the especially younger influencers that I don't really want to name because it's it's not about them. And I just don't really want to, I don't hold them as responsible as the authors that we critique. So I don't, I don't want to mm-hmm. drag them over the coals. Um, but there were several younger influencers mentioned in Shiny Happy People, and they've come out against the documentary saying, you know what, these teachings didn't harm us. You know, like we went to Gothard stuff and it didn't harm us. And so you can't just say that this stuff is all harmful. And I guess what I want to say, and maybe you can comment on is, they can't actually say that. Nope. You need a time machine. You can't actually know whether it harmed you or not. So can you explain that for us? Yeah. So if you're going to go back on your own life and say, hey, this is, I know what harm you, you, you can, to an extent, talk mm-hmm. about these are the things that affected me. Here's the hard things I've had in my life. Here's what I think contributed to them, right? That's the work that we do in talk therapy, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but to go and say this particular thing didn't help or harm me, we would have to go back and get a time machine and then have you run your life where we only changed that thing again and then we could measure it. That would be the only way to know for a person in particular. The other Mm -hmm. thing that we can do though is we can look at the population and we can say, hmm, if people share these characteristics, do they experience an outsized disease burden? Do they experience these negative outcomes more than the general population? What is it about this particular exposure that is helpful or harmful or whatever we're looking Mm -hmm. at, right? Um, And so the reality is that we are each one data point. We are not a population. Mm -hmm. We contain lots of populations of bacteria, but we are one human being. Exactly. And the thing is, like, a lot of times people say, you know, well, this didn't harm me, but you only know your own normal. Yep, you don't exactly. know what other people are experiencing. Like, um, t- tell everybody. about. Well, the, okay, so the, we were talking the... about this earlier today. And I was like, well, you know, in my family, um, no one realized that my nosebleeds were abnormal. Because in my family, a 30 to 60 minute nosebleed this part for the course. <laughs> and then I ended up seeing a hematologist and they were like, oh, oh, I- I'm sorry. What? H- how-, how long? <laughs> oh, um, so <laughs> let's do we, something about that. Let's yeah, do something like, about this, right? Let's make sure that you have a plan. Yeah. Uh, and they gave me some very special gauze so that when I have nosebleeds, I have a mm-hmm. arsenal. It's yes. great. Uh, but essentially, the problem is that it just, it, that was our normal, right? People in my family have long nosebleeds. We didn't realize that it was outside the range of normal. And mm-hmm. it's so difficult when we're only looking at our own life to be able to tease out what is the water that we've been swimming in our whole life that we're not mm-hmm. aware of? What is the impact of the culture that we live in, the time that we live in? What is it even sometimes that we want to believe about ourselves? Um mm-hmm. This isn't to say that these particular influencers are less able to be reliable narrators than Mm -hmm. are the general population. This is a problem, capital P, for humanity, capital H. Yeah. Right? People have struggled with this. And that's why fields Mm -hmm. like sociology exist. That's why epidemiologists study behaviorals, 
behaviors and their impact on health outcomes. Well, I know like even just it was looking at the results from Great Sex Rescue, which made me realize Mm -hmm. why I had vaginismus. Like I hadn't realized it before, you know, but seeing, oh, when people believe this stuff, when they're taught this stuff, it makes it so much more likely. And I'm like, that clicks, right? But I had never known that before. And if you had asked me, did this harm you? I would have said no, because I didn't realize the you know, the correlations there. And, you know, when, when we look at how a lot of the teachings around the Gothard movement about modesty, um, about how men are just lustful beings who, who really can't help it, um, about obligation, sex, about entitlement, you know, these things are all part of a lot of these influencers lives. And a lot of the outcomes like anorgasmia, low libido, um, (laughs) you know, obligation, sex messages, we're still seeing them in not just these particular influencers, although it is there, but like in a lot of these influencers. And so they say it doesn't affect them. And yet we're seeing the effects in their videos. And I guess, I guess what I just want to say is like, we have this idea that, well, it didn't hurt me and that that's a good argument. But actually over and over again, we find that no, there's this stuff actually leads to really bad stuff. And maybe for you, anxiety is just a normal part of life. And you don't realize, hey, I didn't actually have to be this anxious. Maybe it's how I grew up, you know, or, you know, people tend to have a higher libido that, than I do. And maybe if I hadn't have gone through all this, I would have a higher libido. And I think my libido is normal, but actually, and the libido's I hate the words normal around libido, so I don't, I shouldn't maybe use Mm -hmm. that one, but, but, you know, things might've been easier for you. The the other thing is that you also may have been spared. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So for example, I, I actually, my first, I am now a sex researcher, uh, but I started my research career actually studying mycobacterium tuberculosis and doing uh, mouse studies uh, mm-hmm. in a lab. I was a little undergrad researcher, so like I did studies is putting it a bit much. But anyway, my point yeah. is that only 10% of people who have active T or who have TB in their lungs, not active TB infection, who have TB in their lungs growing Mm -hmm. or or present there will actually end up developing active tuberculosis disease. So they'll actually have the active multiplying bacteria that's causing the cough and the consumption that you would think of with like the Brontes. The the other 90% were spared. And so we could say, oh, well, I have tuberculosis in my lungs, but I have never developed TB. Therefore, it's not actually harmful. And it's like, hello. Yeah. TB kills huge numbers of people every year. Um, It's an absolutely horrific pathogen. And just because it only ends up developing active disease in 10% of people doesn't, the presence of the 90% does not negate the 10%. Yes. And so I find it very strange to say I wasn't affected, therefore it wasn't bad, or Mm -hmm. therefore um, we should still allow this stuff in some way. It's like, well, well, no. Mm-hmm. even if they were the minority which i am not seeing that point but even if that were true mm-hmm. jesus says we lead the 99 to go after the one like that's like the parable the biggie <laughs> you leave the 99 to go after the one and so how can we say i personally was not hurt therefore i don't have to care yeah exactly we should care we should go after the ones so that is a great way to end this podcast Um, So just remember harm matters. And as Christians, we should be trying to reduce harm and we should be trying to get everyone to health and wholeness because Jesus said that he came to give us life and give it abundantly. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're aiming for here at Bear Marriage. And so keep a lookout. Um, The announcement for our uh, uh, new wineskins webinar is in the link and you can find it there because that's happening next week. And I hope so many people can come so that we can talk about how we can share our results uh, with our churches and get them talking about this in a healthy way. So thank Thank you for joining us and we will see you again next week on the Bear Marriage Podcast. (laughs) Bye-bye.